Well, this is part four of this series. My humble opinion, it's been a really nice one. <laughs> and uh, it's called Famine and Family in the Book of Ruth. And there was a intent behind that title. And that is throughout the scriptures, you see joys and sorrows. And that's our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Uh, it's every marriage. There are joys and sorrows in family and business relationships, um, you know, in anything, any kind of connections, there are joys and sorrows. And sorrows often happen because we fix our eyes on something other than Jesus and we look to something other than Jesus for contentment. And one of the hardest verses in the Bible for me is where Paul said, and, what, and Paul had it, he had it bad. And yet he's probably the most joyful guy I've ever seen in the Bible. And he said, I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I have never said that once in my life. <laughs> never once. But I do believe it's possible. I've experienced moments of contentment. And those moments of contentment are always, always predicated by gratitude, with gratitude. That is, when we are truly thankful, we're content. When we are bitter, Linda and I were talking about it, we're discontent. When we are fearful, we're discontent. Fear accompanies adverse circumstances oftentimes. And the adverse circumstance of Ruth, well, we've seen some of it, uh, but certainly with Naomi and Elimelech, is that there was a famine that drove them down to Moab where their two sons, Elimelech and Naomi's two sons, would meet these women, Ruth and Orpah. So it ended up, we're going to see something so beautiful today that what we oftentimes mean for evil or what we interpret as bad or calamity or disaster or sorrow, God is always working it for good, for our good and his glory, always. There's never a time where God has ill intent for you, his children. He's the perfect parent, amen? There is no greater parent. And his watchful eye is always over us. So we're reminding ourselves of the characters in this story. Elimelech, he's long gone. He died there in Moab. They went down there and he died. Uh, and, and Naomi is the mom. She's, she's the, the matriarch here, if you will. Malon, they had two kids, Malon and Chilion. And then they go down to Moab and meet Orpah and Ruth, the daughters-in-law. And in chapter 2, remember, Naomi has this kind of kinsman, or Elimelech. The, her ex-husband, her, her deceased husband, has this kinsman. He's related. They're, they're kinfolk. And his name's Boaz. And Boaz has lots of land, you know, property, farming. And he has these reapers that take care of the land. And this Ruth lady is wanting to meet someone and her mother-in-law, Naomi, is encouraging her. Yeah, it's a good way to do it. Farming, that's all they knew back then. Let's go meet someone out on the farm. And Boaz's reapers are normal dudes, crass, rude, shallow, given to exploiting women. And that's why he said, don't mess with Ruth. Don't mess with her. And they 
obviously were not messing with the other women because Boaz, who were in the field working, because Boaz had instructed those reapers. Don't mess with Ruth. Don't mess with the other women. And he even said to Ruth, go hang with these young women. Don't go off into any other field. You'll be protected here. And he didn't have ulterior motives. He was a man of dignity. He was watching over her sincerely. And he had heard of her reputation. And he had heard of Naomi's reputation. It had spread. So the scenario was that she went husband shopping, right? Remember that. Boaz protects, reapers obey, and Ruth is completely honoring Boaz throughout all of this. She's thrilled that this man, whom scholars believe is about 40 years older, remember, we, they, most of them say he was about 80 and Ruth was about 40. She was just respecting this dignified Powerful man, called him a man of prominence. And so we see this mutual honoring that is so beautiful. And what a, what a story it tells us, how we are to honor one another. And it is something we all must strive for continually. And, and, and it, it, it's usually something that should affect our lives because almost every single one of us will have that one person or two or 40 that, that we have not necessarily been honoring. I know that's true in my life. Uh, something happened today. I'm not going to spill any details, but someone... Uh, referred to Putin as a twit. And I reject that. He's a man who needs Christ. Just like the leaders of all those countries who are at war. They need Jesus. We mustn't take sides. We don't take sides with unbelievers. We love them by praying for them that they may receive the love of Christ and find contentment and joy in him and his peace which passes understanding. And that should occupy our minds as we're approaching this election. We are praying for God's choice. Amen? We are praying. We are intentionally praying ahead of time for the person God will have be in office. And he commands us to in 1 Timothy 2. And then chapter 3, Naomi gives Ruth dating advice. <laughs> right? As every great mother should. Every mother, every father should be intimately involved in their kids' lives. And here's Naomi, a mother-in-law whom Ruth adored. And she's giving Ruth dating advice. And it was sound advice. I don't really see anything in it that was unsound. Some people might say, oh, what? Asking him, asking her to go sleep, you know, slip in at midnight after he's eaten and had, you know, a little bit to drink and content it and, and lie down at his, at his feet and then wake him up at, at midnight, you know? <laughs> it's odd, but it, it, again, it was probably a cultural thing. But Naomi's just wonderful. She, she's beautiful. And Ruth meets Boaz at midnight, and Boaz goes, whoa. That's in the Hebrew. No, it's not. Boaz continues to honor Ruth. Most men, if they were woken, awakened by a beautiful woman at midnight, would probably try to take advantage of that woman. Not Boaz. Not Boaz. We can learn so much. And Ruth continues to honor him. I mean, it's just, it just continues and continues and continues. And honor of one another. Esteem, as Paul calls it, right? Let each of you esteem others as better than yourselves. When we esteem others, fruit, good fruit, is always born from that. 
when we serve others. That's why Jesus said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of everyone. Dang, that's hard. Serving everyone. And doing it joyfully, cheerfully. You know, when the Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver, he's not just talking about money. I mean, of course, you know, when we give money, we want to do it cheerfully. And it says when we give, we should give according to what we have, not what we don't have, right? So God is big on that. And it doesn't always have to be in the form of a dollar or finances. Serving oftentimes has to do with something that is a little bit harder than just giving money, amen? It's giving of your time, your efforts, your compassion. And it's just just running through this book. I mean, today in our weird white-collar society, we used to be a blue-collar civilization, right? We were a blue-collar, we worked with our hands. And I say our when I say, you know, I'm talking about humanity. We used to work with our hands and, and we felt productive because our hands were getting into the dirt and, and, and we were using our bodies and we were tired at night. And when we were tired, we would usually sleep better because we weren't looking at all this weird blue light that you know some of the researchers are saying, you know, computers and iPhones, when you look at them at night, which I do every night, I'm just such a dunce. When we look at those things, they oftentimes can keep us awake. But back then, man, everybody was using their bodies. And you know how it is when you use your body to work and you've worked really hard. Man, that son of mine, he works so hard when he works so hard and, and he goes to sleep. And, and it's just, it, it, it's like, how does he do that? How does he do it so fast? It almost always takes me a half hour, 45 minutes to go to sleep. Probably because that dumb phone, you know? And it doesn't matter if you're reading some sort of a theological article. You know, as things keep us up. I mean, if you wonder, if, you're watch, if you stay up and you're watching a horror movie, and you, and you turn it off after it's over, probably 13, I don't know, whatever you watch, and, and, and you're struggling sleeping, maybe you might want to ask the question, is it possible that that's keeping me up? But they didn't have electronics back then. They had oxen and wheat and barley and they were walking. You know, I have never walked so much in my life as I did in this last move. <laughs> February 1st through the 8th, I swear I probably walked 50 miles. I, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I mean constant. Back and forth to the car, bending over, turning, just doing this. You know, dishes, taking them out, sitting down, breaking my back. You know, I mean, it was just left and right. That's what they used to do all the time. And when they traveled, they walked 50 miles to go to Moab. And then when the famine was over in Bethlehem, they walked 50 miles back. Right? So you got to have a lot of respect for that lifestyle. And I'm not encouraging all of us to go Amish or anything like that. I, I don't know that I could function without electronics. I just don't. I mean, it's so in my brain. That's all I've known since 1994 is electronics. All my messages all my studies, they've all, they're all with electronics. I researched the church fathers. I, I, I researched church history. I researched Old Testament history, New Testament. It's all there. I don't need books anymore, praise the Lord. Because I, I can access everything online. I don't have to have. I got like 2,500 books in Page, Arizona at my house, stored away. And they used to fill up these bookshelves. Looks cool. But man, you think I'm going to pack those things up and move those wherever I go? Heck no. It's at my fingertips. It's different back then. They didn't have printers. They didn't even have the printing press at the time of Ruth. Holy cow, the printing press was going to take place 2,500 years later at the time of Luther. Anyway, I digress. Boaz, last honors who? Naomi. Every woman who is seeking a spouse, every man who is seeking a spouse must honor the parents. You must. You have to. Even Jacob, he honored that lying, we call him LL, lying Laban. 
<laughs> right? I'll give you Rachel. After seven years, you work for me. Nope. He gave Jacob Leah. And she was cross-eyed. <laughs> That's what it says. Leah had weak eyes, remember that? It's kind of like when you do this, right? So he woke up, realized, oh my gosh, because there's the veil thing. He woke up, he's like, what in the world? Who are you looking at, me or over there? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But then he had to work. <laughs> he had to work another seven years to get Leah or to get Rachel. So 14 years he honored lying Laban. We don't see that today, do we? We're sort of like a Bonnie and Clyde society. You know, you fall in love with this girl, you're 17, she's 16, parents don't see it working out, you know, and, and they're like, no, this is meant to be. And then they run away and they elope. And then they go to prison. <laughs> Sorry, that's drastic. But then we got to the end of chapter two, waiting on an answer from kin, <laughs> not K-E-N, K-I-N, kinfolk, okay? All right, chapter four, read the fine print. Read the fine print. What am I getting at here? Let's move through this. So we're wanting to find out, remember in chapter three, the nobility of Boaz is, is just, has culminated by saying, I know that there's someone who is a closer relative to deceased Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband, than I am. Even though he sees the beauty, sees the dignity, sees the refined quality of Ruth, he still says, I'm going to do what we're supposed to do from the scriptures, and that is, got to be the nearest of kin to raise up seed for the deceased man. And that was a hard thing to do back then. You say, what's so hard about that? You know, hey, <laughs> seems like a little fun under the covers. Raise up seed for this person. No, no, no. You're actually taking on that person. You're taking on that person. In other words, it to keep the seed, to keep the line going, it's like the last name. It's like if, if all of a sudden I died and, and, and both my boys died, well, the name finally has gone, right? So that was a big thing, to keep the name going. And so there was an example in the Old Testament Scripture where there was a man named Onan who got, whom God commanded to raise up seed for his brother uh, because uh, he had died. And so God said, go take your brother's wife Raise up seed for your brother. In other words, it would be named after the brother. Well, these guys were very big on their name. So whenever there was like a curse that was brought about on these old kings that were evil, and God would say, I'm going to blot out your name. He would say that. I'm going to blot out your name, blot out your memory. That was a serious thing back then. And so Onan... To, just sought the pleasure. And he went into the woman, but he spilled his seed on the ground, disobeying God, and God slew him. That's what the Bible says. Because he disobeyed that command of God. Old Testament was strict. It was some harsh stuff. So here's this command. And Boaz says, listen, I will do it, but only if the next of kin won't because I want to follow the Lord. You see that? So he's going to ask this close kinfolk, closer. He's closer. No sooner, Ruth 4, 1 through 22, had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came passing by. So Boaz said, Come over, friend. Sit down here. So now here's where Boaz it gets a little subtle. It gets a little tricky. And he went over and sat down. This is where you have to read the fine print. Closest kin. Then Boaz took 10 men of the elders of the city. He wanted witnesses, right? Because that was something that was taught in the Old Testament. 
In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And there were elders and judges that God would set up to, to have this, you know, keep things accountable. Keep everything, you know, authentic. Not this behind the back, the gossip thing. That's why Jesus is like, you know, if you have something against your brother, go to your brother and if, or sister. And if he or she won't hear you, then take a couple of witnesses. Jesus doesn't want gossip. He doesn't want hearsay. So Boaz grabs these 10 elders. This is an important thing. This is a lifelong decision. Now, don't think in your wildest dreams that Boaz is not concerned about Ruth. I think he digs her. I'm just going to be honest. I think he absolutely digs this woman, but he's more dignified about serving the Lord and honoring her and honoring Naomi than his own selfish ambition and desires. But keep in mind, he also is going to be a servant by taking on Ruth. You'll see right now. He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, this closest relative of Elimelech, the deceased husband, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. We're related to him, but you're closer. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, now watch, buy it, this parcel of land, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. This is going to be legit. It's going to be a legal contract. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know. For there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. And you. In other words, you're the closest to Elimelech. I'm almost as close, but not as close as you. So he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, Here's the fine print. So we got it. It's just, it's kind of tricky. It just seems like he got the guy to commit to the land, but not to what comes with the land. <laughs> the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite. So check that out. You are also acquiring a non-Israelite, a non-Jew. You're going to marry a non-Jew. She's already joined herself to the Lord. She's no longer. She was a foreigner. And the Bible says, man, when that foreigner comes in to worship God, you take that foreigner in. You take him in. That was Old Testament. And so she followed Naomi and she said, I'm going to serve your God. I'm going to go and follow your people. Be your, I want to be a part of y'all. And I will die where you die. That's how committed. But this next of kin, he's like, ah, I don't do Jew, uh, uh, non-Jews. I'll do the land. I ain't going to do a Moabite. And I think that that may have been what was going on in his mind. So you also have to acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain, here it is, and this is the hard part, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. You see, we don't really get this fully, but it's like, what? If I'm going to raise up seed for someone, I want it to be my name. And certainly if I'm going to raise up seed, it better be a Jew. <laughs> it's not going to be for with a Moabite woman? Are you kidding me? So this is a part of this big history of how the Jews were historically, the Israelites were historically racist. At this, the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, Boaz, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. 
Does everybody kind of get it? Okay. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. It's like shaking hands. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, and you got to kind of think to yourself that Boaz was going, oh, I hope he says no, I hope he doesn't. You know what I mean? You just kind of wonder. You know how sometimes we're like, we want to act like we're doing a good deed, but deep down we're kind of hoping. I've done that before. And sometimes I've been disappointed. <laughs> Boaz said to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses <laughs> that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, all this property, and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife. Now watch. This is his dignity. To maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. That is servanthood right there. If you, if you really could grasp that culture and just think about how important carrying on your own name was and what an act of service it would be to actually go into a woman, inseminate her, and carry on someone else's name. Think about it. I mean, just kind of transpose that into our generation. What that would be like. My son, a Finley, right? Is going to carry on the name of this clown and, and, and it's going to be with this non-Jew. Are you feeling the, the tension there? Try and feel that for a second. I couldn't imagine that. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to just be honest with you all. I, I couldn't imagine having Austin be like a Jones or something. There's my son, Austin Jones. It might create even a little bit of division. I don't know. In order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Then all the people who were at the gate along with the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord watch. This gets so beautiful. Here's where we start to see Jesus. You ready to see Christ? We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman whom is coming to your house like what? Rachel and Leah. Who together built up the house of Israel. Now here it is. Remember the first verse that, that Linda read? Out of you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah shall come forth he who is to be governor of Israel, whose goings are from of old. This isn't random. They go back to Bethlehem and look what it says. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem and through the children that the Lord will give you by this young non-Jew. This is staggering. And it destroys racism. Do you see that? It destroys racism. Ruth was a pagan. Watch. Through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Tamar slept with her father-in-law for money. She was a prostitute. In other words, they're going, you know what? God uses evil for good. It gets better. So Boaz took Ruth. She became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive. She bore a son. 
Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life. Do you see the type of Christ? And a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. Ruth, a servant non-Jew who joined them, bears a son for her mother-in-law to raise. Do you see that? Do you see the love that's going on here? The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. You get it? Ruth, a non-Jew, gives birth to a son who would be the grandfather of David, but it, the son is raised by Naomi. And from that line, Judah would be born Jesus in Bethlehem. Man, I, I've read Ruth, I don't know how many times, but it just is so profound how the whole Bible is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This isn't by accident. Jesus comes from this line that involved a prostitute and a pagan. Isn't that beautiful? He comes from an, a line that involves all of us. Prostitutes, pagans, idolaters, murderers, rapists, gossips, thieves, it's all of us apart from Christ. And he says, I love you because I chose to. I don't do things the way you do things. That's why you see Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. Who gets the blessing? Jacob. God's like, I don't do things the way you do. This is not about firstborn. Or Isaac and Ishmael, who was the firstborn? Ishmael, but Isaac got the blessing. You see, God doesn't do things the way we want him necessarily to do things. So that we would know that there is no difference, as Paul said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Everything points to Jesus, and that's the story of the book of Ruth. Servanthood, honor, receiving the foreigner, the stranger, the alien, destroying all, all shreds of racism that might be in our hearts to know that our Savior came from those lines. So praise the Lord for this glorious book. And I encourage you all, after these four studies, go back and read it. Just do a, a, a reading through it. It'll take you maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes. Just read through the four chapters. Each chapter is maybe a page and a half. Just read through it to, to kind of uh, reinforce what we've learned, what we've studied. And may God bless you as you do so.